introduction to so this is the first of the webinar series uh, on, on harm reduction advocacy. And I forgot to, to tell you that uh, uh, the webinar will be recorded. So if you have uh, any problems with that, uh, please tell it now or keep it in yourself forever. So the, the recording will be only used for you know, educational purpose. Uh, so that means that if you, after my presentation, if you will speak, that will be part of the recording, but otherwise you will be not, uh, not recorded. So uh, this series, which we start now, is uh, we're, this, this will continue from uh, say on, and the next uh, webinar will be on May 2029 20, on video advocacy. Uh, my colleague Istvan uh, will, uh, teach people on, on how to use the video, video storytelling to change drug policies. The third webinar will be on the 11th of June uh, on the meaningful involvement of civil society correlation. Undertook a study on, uh, on the quality of uh, civil society involvement in the field of drug policies in four countries. So we will present this study with the findings and also uh, we hope that some of the people from those four countries, Ireland, Greece, Finland, and Hungary, will uh, tell you what kind of problems they encounter with, with, with in this process. And the fourth webinar will be on fighting disinformation and moral panics, uh, which is, I think, quite relevant in this age of disinformation for us who are advocating harm reduction. I will not be able to follow up the chat discussion during my presentation, but Hannah, our colleague from Correlation will. Uh, I, will I would like to ask you if you have any questions or comments, please, uh, or either write it in the chat or uh, keep it until the end of my presentation and then you can ask, uh, ask, ask questions or comments. And I also asked a few people uh, to, to give you a short story about harm reduction advocacy in their own countries. So my, my uh, presentation will be a kind of theoretic, theoretic, more theoretical introduction on, 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 on advocacy, uh, how we planning in advocacy, what kind of uh, uh, audiences we would like to reach, uh, what kind of methods we use, and uh, then we can listen to some examples from individual countries on successes and failures in advocacy. And then, of course, the floor will be yours and we can discuss uh, everything that is in your mind. Of course, I'm not here as a person who will tell you the ultimate solutions in advocacy because I believe they don't exist. The, each and every country, each and every city has very specific context and I don't believe in universal methods or universal uh, ways uh, to to you know to that can be translated in every every kind of political and uh, and, and and cultural context. So uh, let's start with uh, with defining what is advocacy. So uh, advocacy, in the most general uh, definition of the term, it is. Uh, it is uh, arguing for, for a cause or an idea, but we here here we are speaking about a more specific definition of advocacy, which is uh, influencing policy decision making. In, in our case, influencing drug policy decision making making in favor of harm reduction. And of course, advocacy can uh, include different kind of uh, uh, things like questioning existing drug policies. Uh, we would we can uh, change public attitudes participate in the setting of the agenda uh, by policymakers. Uh, we can propose alternative policies, create space for a dialogue, mobilize people for a cause, uh, and giving vulnerable people a voice. So those communities who usually are very underrepresented in the media. And we can also call it advocacy when we just try to make the systems, uh, decision-making systems more transparable and, uh, transparent and accountable. For example, my own organization have been doing this at the United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drugs for, for several years, actually since 2004. We do uh, video reportings and, uh, and we try to make this 
otherwise quite obscure and bureaucratic system of the UN uh, drug control system or uh, visible for for people from the outside. Um, so when we speak about advocacy with uh, harm reduction organizations, usually they list several challenges. Why 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 we why we can't really uh, why we can't really engage with, in in advocacy? So m many times I hear from people that. Um, uh, there are barriers such as, you know, organizations have no time, they have no staff members dedicated on doing advocacy. Of course, there is no funding for advocacy in many countries, especially not from national governments, uh, but sometimes there is a very scarce money from international donors. Organizations sometimes have no know-how, how to do advocacy. There is a hostility from the political uh, landscape, from decision makers. There is a fear of being labeled, uh, fear of losing funding. If you are critical to the government, then you can lose funding. This was actually confirmed by our latest research on civil society involvement, that many organizations feel that if you criticize the government, then you can lose your, your funding. Uh, and of course, um, of course, uh, there is a lack of understanding of what is the role of civil society in the realm of politics. So some people believe that civil society organizations have nothing to do with, with policymaking. That's the task of a separate um, privileged political class. So if you get involved to that, then you are something like an imposter. Uh, but it's not, in reality, it's not the case. So civil society has each, each every right, you know, to uh, get heard by, by decision makers and influence policy decision make, making. Um, so what, what activities comprise of advocacy work? We can uh, include here community organizing, when you organize the community to, to speak up for their own rights different kinds of activism, awareness raising, public education. Uh, we can build coalitions. We can uh, advise council decision maker makers. Uh, we can do campaigns, media campaigns, uh, either on the social media or on, on the mainstream media. We can organize training courses, sensitizing, for example, officials or decision makers or whatever target groups. We can do strategic litigation. I think this is a particularly underused uh, tool, advocacy tool in our, especially in Europe. Or I don't know it. Not not. I don't know much about um, other regions, but I suppose it's the same situation that uh, organizations usually don't have the resources and connections to to do litigation. So that's the when you're in a strategic human rights abuse, you hire a lawyer and you go to court. And I think here we can do still a lot of, we, have, we still have a lot of work, you know, to connect to human rights organizations who have these capacities and who can help us to, uh, to litigate in, 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 in uh, dire human rights abuse situations. And of course you can do lobbying, um, contacting directly uh, political decision makers. I will speak about these a bit later. Uh, if if we look at like the theory of how policy making works, there are different kinds of attitudes and approaches or explanations how policy making uh, is uh, does work. Uh, uh, there is uh, one uh, model we can call it a rational model, which considers that policy making is a rational decision making uh, process. So this is the classical way, like. You as a researcher, you produce, or you're an activist, you produce the evidence, you present it to the decision makers, you convince them that this is the best policy and they will do uh, accordingly. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, model is kind of naive if you look at the reality on the ground. So um, there are other types of um, policy, there are other models, explanatory models of policy making. There is the Byzantine model, the decisions are the results of power games, behind the scene games between elite groups and stakeholders. So we need to focus on the compromises behind the, the closed doors. 
Uh, and uh, there is the participatory model, which which is trying, you know, to uh, to uh, to recognize the various perspectives of different pressure groups. And and I think decision maker can be can, this decision making can be quite different in different countries, right? For example, when we did the research on civil society involvement in four countries, we could very well see that uh, decision making works very differently in let's say Finland than in Greece. Uh, Greece is maybe more closer to this Byzantine model and Ireland, uh, Finland is closer to the uh, rational and participatory one. Um, and uh, uh, you, I believe that uh, drug policies are very often driven by moral panics, not by evidence, but moral panics. Uh, moral panics that are created or generated by by uh, by uh, media. So this this theory, the moral panic theory, is, comes from uh, Stanley Cohen's uh, book *Folk Devils and Moral Panics*. And if you look at the history of drug policies uh, in the world, or maybe only in Europe, that you can you can also see that uh, that there are, there were like different waves of moral panics that usually resulted in more and more repressive drug policies. Uh, and, uh, and, and what we do in the media or what we do as advocates is very often we try to uh, counter this, this moral panics and we try to also use them to propose our own solutions, harm reduction solutions. So we say that, yeah, there are really problems, but the solution is not more repression, but we need, we need more Less repression and more support, uh, more more harm reduction to people, um, and and I think it's also very important to know that we we should not only focus on the evidence on what works and cost of what is cost effective, but we have to address the fears and prejudices of everyday people in advocacy. So that's that's not something we can avoid. So we we have to deal with it, and. Um, and of course, advocacy uh, sometimes targets directly decision makers, but usually you are having a broader uh, focus because there are different spheres of influence. Who are influencing uh, the decision makers? Who have a voice? Who has an influence on, on, on making those decisions? So our advocacy sometimes can focus on these key players. Uh, uh, different advocacy organizations, churches, universities, research institutions, community groups, think tanks, media, uh, union and labor organizations, the general public. So these are sometimes in, in certain issues uh, very, very influential and, and we have to address them and we have to make them allies if it's possible. So may raise awareness and make them allies. Uh, different NGOs use different kinds of tactics uh, that in, in advocacy. So some organizations focus only on advising decision makers and uh, and presenting the evidence. Uh, that then you know other other organizations focus on on activism. Uh, and and there are organizations focusing on media campaigning or lobbying or different you know combination of these fours, but not necessarily every each and every organization has to deal with with all all, all kinds of uh, uh, forms of uh, of advocacy. Some organizations are more uh, confrontational, and and other organizations are less uh, conf confrontational. And uh, we have to adjust our advocacy. Uh, a plan to this. Uh, and uh, a few years ago, I wrote an article about, you know, kind of categorizing different, different, uh, different ways of different advocates in harm reduction or in drug policy based on my experience as a, as, as a person working in, in drug policy advocacy. And I differentiated four, four, group, four, four major groups in the let's say the style of advocacy among harm reductionists and one is the alls the alls are using the rational arguments they are very good in producing and presenting the evidence uh, to decision uh, makers then there are the foxes you know those are 
very pragmatic and flexible advocates who try to deal with, who are usually, you know, con perceive uh, decision making uh, according to this Byzantine model, you know, that you have to do make the deals behind the closed doors, you have to make compromises, and usually they try to avoid open confrontation with decision makers. Then there are the docs, the vice docs, those organizations, usually human rights organizations who are monitoring and uh, the transparency and accountability of uh, the government. And usually these organizations compared to the foxes or these, these people, they usually like, uh, like publicity and confrontation with power. And finally, there are the elephants, uh, those community activists who, who are trying to use more, mostly, um, you know, the power of the heart, to, if I can say so, uh, using using the you know the community voices in their in their advocacy. Of course, you can do all kinds of categorization, but maybe while I was talking about these four types, some of you recognized the differences, or in your own experience, you also have these types of uh, peers or friends who use different tactics in advocacy, uh, in their own advocacy uh, issue, activities. So uh, uh, let's also clarify the difference between uh, advocacy and lobbying. So advocacy is a more general uh, term. Uh, it means that when you are raising awareness about the impact of policies, lobbying is a more specific uh, kind of advocacy. So uh, lobbying is influ influencing a politician on a special issue, on a special piece of legislation. Lobbying has two different uh, forms. Uh, one form is um, direct lobbying. Then you have a direct uh, communication with decision makers. So you call a decision maker, you go uh, and, and have a meeting with them uh, directly. And that is grassroots lobbying. When you ask the general public or community uh, to uh, communicate with the decision maker or put some pressure on the on the decision maker, uh, and when you are uh, planning your advocacy activities, uh, first of all, you need to have uh, um, you you need to follow a process, just like when you are designing new services like harm reduction services. If you design any kind of advocacy activity, it's, it's, it's good, you know, to go through the same process. You identify the problems uh, that needs to be addressed. Then second, you do some kind of research, which is not, of course, um, uh, very uh, randomized clinical trial or something like that, but at least, you know, to assess the situation to have the necessary information uh, to, uh, on like who is making decisions and how, what is really needed. Then you can create a plan, an advocacy plan, and, uh, and, and then you are acting on this plan. So we are implementing this plan and evaluate and monitoring this plan. Now I will uh, speak a bit later about evaluation, which is in the case of advocacy, it's much, much more difficult to evaluate advocacy than, for example, evaluate service provision, because it's a, it's a, it's a bigger challenge. Um, and, you know, when, when you are, when you are, uh, when you are doing the first step of this cycle, so you are, uh, you are uh, making a kind of assessment or research, then uh, there are, the same cycle in this policy decision making, uh, which you can see with, with your own advocacy or which you can see with uh, designing services. So the decision makers also follow their own cycles. So, and you, you have to see that where your issue is on this cycle right now. So what is the best uh, momentum to engage with, with the stakeholders? So, for example, if there is an upcoming new national drug strategy in your country or in your city, or there is a piece of legislation that will be changed uh, soon. So you, you have to see like where is, where, where is, where is your issue on this cycle. And, uh, and uh, then you have to ask a few questions uh, to answer, you have to answer a few questions before you start uh, planning or creating your advocacy plan. What is the appropriate action? Which public body is making the decision? It's often, you know, like you are pushing uh, 
some uh, decision makers for several years, and maybe they are not the real people who you should you should engage with because they are not the ones who can make the change in your country. Um, so it's, it's very important to see which decision makers should you ex address. Uh, and who are these key, key decision makers? Maybe it's a committee chair or members of parliament, ministry officials, party leaders. Maybe the decision, real decisions are made behind, beyond the, the government administration. And, um, and, and, and you should also see who is uh, lobbying in support of this issue or against uh, the issue. What are, you have to see what are their arguments, what are the messages, because if uh, they use, if, if, if the real arguments behind, uh, for example, repressive drug policies is different, what you use in your messaging, in your advocacy, then you will have no, uh, no impact. And it's also very important, you know, to spot the, the policy windows. Policy windows are actually those, um, let's say, very rare occasions when there are three, uh, three uh, factors uh, correspond. So that is that is that is uh, a problem is addressed in your in your country or in, in the political discourse. There are there are, there are new uh, solutions or technologies to solve that problem, and um, and and also there is a, there is an openness from politic politicians from the political sphere. Maybe there was a change of government, change of mayor, or whatever. So when all these trees are open, then the policy window is open. So the issue will be very easy to put on the agenda and, and your knowledge and your expert, expertise will be more important. So I think in advocacy, it's, also, it's very important to spot these policy windows. If there is no open window, then you can waste a lot of resources and, and you will not have a, a, an impact. Um, so a few questions before you ask, uh, before you create your advocacy plan. What is the change I would like to see as a result of my advocacy? This sounds very simple, but sometimes organizations don't, don't ask this question. Like what is the real change I want to see? A concrete change. What decisions should be made to achieve this goal? Who are those decision makers who have the power to make these decisions? What tools, activities are the most effective to influence them? Because this can, you know, vary according to different uh, groups of uh, of key key uh, players. How can I monitor this advocacy activities? Who are my life enemies, and what is the time frame? So actually, uh, an advocacy plan is pretty simple. Uh, it's a simple exercise. You need to have a goal, an objective, an indicator. You need to list your allies, the targets, activities, and a time frame. So this this is um, it is quite useful to do this plan before you start, for example, an advocacy campaign, media campaign, or whatever kind of advocacy activity. Uh, and of course, um, uh, you we can use different types of advocacy methods uh, according to the let's say the openness and uh, the openness of the decision maker and the political context uh, for example we can uh, coalition building can be a very useful uh, advocacy method so when we are building alliances with other organizations in order to create a movement and so sometimes you should think outside of the box here so we can uh, making allies from women rights organizations, human rights organizations, maybe, you know, child, uh, ch ch uh, child care uh, organizations. We can make allies with, uh, with maybe environmental organizations so, or, or those organizations fighting for racial justice. So uh, these, these coalitions can be multiplying our influence and voice. So I think it's it's pretty important to invest some work in, in building these kind of coalitions. Uh, then the decision maker is open. So the, then the decision, when the decision maker is listening to you, then maybe the best way and the first, first method to try is direct lobbying. So you, you go to the, you ask for a, for a meeting, you go directly speaking to the decision maker, uh, 
and you present your uh, solution to the to the decision maker. You bring the, bring your materials, papers, brief, briefings. Then the policymaker is not very open to listen to you, but can be swayed by public opinion. So if you can change, if you can put some public pressure, then maybe the the decision maker can be swayed. You can do some kind of mobilization, mass actions, for example, march, rally, petition, open letter. In this case, can be uh, pretty pretty uh, useful sometimes. Uh, and then uh, when the pol policymaker is not accessible or the goal is, cha is changing social attitudes, then you can do a media campaign with press releases, press conferences, different kinds of uh, uh, of of, uh, of uh, media methods, which. Uh, which which can be effective with uh, uh, in the social media and in the mainstream uh, media, and of course, uh, if you can, you can also uh, you can also um, uh, see like who is your allies, who 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 is neutral among the key key players, and who are your opponents, and you know the best. Advocacy or the best way to do advocacy is uh, then, then, then you, if you try to do the neutrals allies and the opponents neutrals. Uh, of course, this is your best interest that you 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 need as less opponents as possible. And um, there are some very other some very, very basic and useful exercises to do before doing advocacy, like a simple uh, uh, a stakeholder analysis. When you are, uh, you know, categorizing different key players according to their influence and according to their impact, and then you can see, you know, like who are those, uh, the, who are those key players who you sh sh should really uh, invest a lot to uh, control and uh, man manage them closely, and who are those who don't really need to be uh, engaged very actively. Uh, and, and this, ideally, you do it in your team. Uh, and after this exercise, I think you can uh, prioritize your resources much better in, in advocacy. Uh, there is a, an import, uh, an interesting, uh, interesting example of, uh, let's say, kind of mapping the drug policy sphere, political sphere of drug policy in the UK. It was recently published by Alex Stevens. Uh, drug policy expert from the UK in his new book. I, I recommend you. It's very, pretty interesting about drug policies, uh, drug policy constellations. And on this, you can see on the uh, on the screen, uh, he created a sociogram of uh, based on interviews with all kinds of uh, decision, all kinds of uh, key players in the field of drug policy, and uh, he puts uh, them on the map. Uh, according to four categories, um, progressive social justice, paternalism, traditionalism, and liberty. And it's interesting, you know, it, it's, a, it's a kind of interesting map which, which came up. Like uh, you see that on the uh, top left side, uh, there are the more human rights, more social justice oriented, harm reduction, uh, and decriminalization, pro decriminalization activists. And then there are those who are like pro-treatment uh, people uh, on the on the right side, and uh, on the right uh, bottom side there are the traditionalists who are you know for restriction and criminalization, and uh, a different kinds of um, um, position uh, in, in a different kind of position there are the pro-cannabis activists who are usually more on the libertarian. Uh, side of the of the map, so uh, I think it's, it it would be pretty interesting to replicate this in in other countries to see if we can do that and how how does it look in in other countries. Uh, and sometimes this is a, is a I, I take you give give you an example of uh, of sometimes you know key players or not key players but players from from other fields can influence our our drug policy decision maker making. So uh, sometimes uh, uh, our external uh, forces are 
uh, jumping into the conversation. For example, in New Zealand, there was a, a drug policy reform bill uh, in, which was adopted by the parliament. And that would be, pretty, it was a pretty progressive uh, uh, bill. And unfortunately, unfortunately, in the end, it was uh, blocked by animal rights activists because they said that, you know, this, this bill would make it possible to uh, make clinical trials on new drugs and make, uh, make a regulation of uh, new drugs. But animal rights activists said that no way that you can experiment on animals. And finally, they, this was the this, this was the reason why this bill was blocked uh, from from being implemented. So, uh, so you should be you should expect that sometimes there are external players who can influence uh, the drug policy field. Another useful uh, exercise to do among your team in your organization is the so-called message box. And this uh, message box was uh, uh, produced by uh, by uh, Nancy Barron, and it is usually it's, it's it's used by researchers and academics to kind of translate their research findings to a more consumable uh, information to the general public. So how can you make your message more consumable to the to the general public? And you can, it's also, you can do it in a team that you draw this, uh, you can see on the map, this message box. Uh, so um, here you can see, see it in a bigger picture. So uh, you have to identify what is the problem. So what is the problem with the current policy? Then uh, that is, uh, uh, what is the solution? So what is, you, you propose as an alternative? Uh, then what is the benefits and who is benefiting from your solution? It's very important to highlight uh, the different groups who will benefit. And then um, you, you should also answer the very strange question, so what? And uh, sometimes it's called the so what factor, you know, that because people usually are, there are, there are different kinds of advocates competing for the attention of people and decision makers. And maybe you believe that your case is the most important in the world. It is the closest to your heart and you believe that harm reduction uh, is so logical and so rational that each and every person who denies it or doesn't see that it's important is just simply stupid. But usually, you know, the, the, you, know, you have to uh, think with, uh, with the head of the people on the street and, uh, and with, uh, with the decision maker who is bombarded with different kinds of uh, solutions and proposals from different organizations all the time. And you should convince th them that, um, that, 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 you know, people care about this issue and, and the people will be affected by this issue. And not, it's not only uh, an issue about a small group, but it's, it's, a, it's an issue which is important for the, for the whole society. So um, I think when, for example, before you communicate uh, in, in the media on any kind of harm reduction issue, it's very useful to ask yourself this question, like, so what? And can you, can you really uh, answer this question uh, in a way that uh, simple people in front of the television will uh, agree with you or be convinced? Uh, this is a, an, a, an example of, um, like, what do I mean by so what? For example, for policymakers, uh, does this support my agenda, my political agenda? Do my constituents care? Or with managers, what will this cost? What, what is the time, effort, money? Who, who supports this? Then different, there are other, other NGOs. How does this fit to our agenda? So you can see like, for example, women's rights organizations, how will they benefit from the solution you propose? scientists, um, the media, you know, media for media, it, what is the really important is the, is the news versus So how, how big story is this? Is this a good story? Can I sell it to my, my audience? Um, donors, you know, or, or concerned citizens, how, how, how they will be uh, affected. So you can go through all these, all these categories, all these groups, and you can see like the, that, that your campaign or your message how does it affect them? Um, and of course, the different target groups, 
you need to adjust your your tools, your advocacy tools. So um, when you are targeting professionals like researchers, uh, academics, then of course it's enough to use scientific papers or research reports. And usually, if you just present research reports to political decision makers, that's not a good way of advoc doing advocacy. So you have to, uh, you, you should not anticipate that politicians will read uh, research uh, papers. They need to be translated, uh, the, the evidence it, in short uh, documents, such as policy briefings or fact sheets. So if you go to decision makers, it's always good to bring yourself like a one, two pager or maximum five pager briefing, which you can leave behind. To the, to the decision maker. Um, if you are doing a media campaign, of course, you can organize interviews, you can do press releases, conferences, press conferences. In our media, we have different uh, tra training or media advocacy where we are uh, practicing uh, how to do uh, interviews, how to do press releases and conferences, press conferences. If you do, uh, if, you, if you target the general public, you can use uh, on social media, different kinds of contents, multimedia contents, uh, articles and uh, and reports that are more user friendly. <clears throat> so if you do direct lobbying, uh, I just tell you a few useful tips. Maybe you are uh, even more experienced than me on, on this uh, direct lobbying. And in the, in the after my presentation, you can also add some. But this is my experience and also based on, on uh, some uh, guidelines which I found. So uh, it is important before you go to address the policymaker that you should focus on what is your message. Uh, uh, you are not there to, you know, making a complain, complaining circle, but you, you just fo you focus on your message. Uh, you are also bringing with you some resources, as I mentioned before, like fact sheets or reports, and do, you don't leave the office of the politician without, uh, without providing an ultimate ask. So what is it that you ask from the decision maker uh, to do? And if you are in a group, like maybe three or four people go to the office of the ministry, minister, then you should clarify who is the lead speaker and who is answering specific questions because there is nothing more damaging to your credibility as an NGO than just you know going there and you are interrupting each other and you are uh, contradicting each other. Then that's that's not a good message to the decision maker. Um, it's, it's good to share your stories and um, and. Um, uh, and, and, and it's better to be supportive and assertive and not confrontational in these meetings. Uh, you can be confrontational if the policymaker is not open to talk to you, but if, it's, if uh, they are open, then it's better to emphasize that solving this problem is mutually beneficial for both of you. Or both of you will benefit from, from solving this issue. Of course, you should avoid the professional jargon. You know, we as Hamid Action people, we usually use our um, different kinds of acronyms. Don't do that with the politician because they don't. They will not understand like OST or NSP and all this or this kind of uh, 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 acronyms. And in the end, be polite and uh, and, uh, and thank thank the time. And um, e even if the politician is not supportive, because um, because maybe next time they can be supportive. Uh, then. Uh, I, I always believe that, you know, telling stories, personal stories, and maybe it's not, not uh, surprising uh, considering that my organization is focusing on videos and video storytelling. I believe in the power of story stories more than just, you know, presenting evidence and facts, even if in, in the case of, uh, of decision makers, you know, there, there are some research that says that stories are 20 times time, 10, 22 times more memorable than facts. Uh, and, and it's very important to appeal to the right emotion. Uh, you are not a Wikipedia article. So you, you are not there, you know, just to list the facts, but to provide some uh, specific, specific context and, and perspective. Uh, and you know why I also you know personal stories and lived experience, presenting lived experiences is, is very effective 
because you know you can debate opinions but you cannot debate lived experience so it's it's like lived experience is something quite uh, powerful in in, um, in in advocacy um it's just, it's also interesting you know to see uh, the um, you know like if 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 we if we try to advocate for harm reduction in the media and sometimes you get very frustrated because what we see is that recover as if the recovery agenda is much easier to communicate in the media than than harm reduction so it because because it's so, so simple you know the solution is so simple and it's so kind of you know the binary options you know that as i i am i'm sure you met in the media or social media this kind of presentations that before and after, you know, this that is the story of a person and how uh, how much this person was transformed before when when use drugs and after using drugs and uh, then they show a shiny new uh, picture of that person. So that that's very powerful in the media because you are showing people some kind of you know spiritual transformation of people. So sometimes we can see that in harm reduction. We don't have this kind of, uh, or we may believe that we don't have this kind of uh, the narratives, but we, we also have uh, quite powerful narratives in harm reduction. Saving lives, I think it's also important, but you have to really, uh, you, you have to really uh, substantiate it with, 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 with stories of people, uh, how their lives were changed uh, by harm reduction. And, um, uh, the, on the picture, you can see, for example, this uh, campaign. It was a photo campaign of the U.S.-based harm reduction coalition, uh, where they asked people to define what harm reduction means to them, and this was presented at the U.N. I think that was a quite effective and good uh, piece of advocacy. Uh, uh, so saving lives is always a big value. So you, we have to emphasize that. Um, and the, there is a uh, it is it's also important how you frame your message. Um, there are there are examples for media campaigns, advocacy campaigns, which were counterproductive. So, for example, there was this um, this infamous campaign. But this is like any other. This was a campaign to destigmatize mental health issues, and uh, uh, in the end, there were some assessments of the impact. And it, it appeared that uh, this resulted increased support for treatment, but at the same time, it increased the stigma, medical stigma on on uh, on people who are who, who have any kind of mental health issues. So we have to really be careful with our message uh, and avoid avoid this uh, this mistake. Uh, there is there, there are some research done in what is effective harm reduction messaging. For example, there was uh, one recent study based on interviews with uh, harm reduction uh, activists in in America to see what what worked and what didn't work for them in advocacy or in communication. And what people said that uh, uh, messages about the evidence are, are are important but not sufficient. So it's not enough to, to you know to present the numbers that okay how, how much money you will save to the people with these services or uh, or or how many uh, syringes uh, distributing how many syringes will uh, prevent how many HIV cases or something like that. But there is a need to have to to have some kind of, to deliver some kind of value based messages. So values that are tailored. Of the with the uh, of the spe special audiences you want to reach, and uh, it is also found that uh, messaging that emphasizing that harm reduction is part of an integrated system, a comprehensive solution, are more effective than just standalone harm reduction messages. So you have to emphasize that you know uh, drug consumption room doesn't stand alone in itself, but it's part of a, of an integrated system. Uh, of care and support. Um, and when you do advocacy, uh, it's pretty important, you know, not only to focusing on the problems. I, many cases in Hungary or even in, in the European level, what I see is that when uh, organizations, NGOs or civil society have a meeting with the governments, they try, they, they start to complain and complain and complain. 
Um, and if this is this endless complaining may be satisfying to the people who are complaining, because of course I understand the frustrations that it's you know, really uh, bad to work without appreciation and funding and all these things, but it's not effective. Uh, advocacy. So you should all, if if you if you really do what you want, you would like to do good advocacy, you should uh, propose a concrete, uh, suitable solution to the policymaker, and highlight maybe some in successful international imp implementations of this proposed solution, so to, to show that this is really doable, and um, and uh, you can also uh, prepare the decision maker to attacks. Which they may receive from the from the media or or opposing political parties, you know, like okay, so we can expect that the conservatives will respond to this new drug consumption room with these and these arguments, and then you can use these and these uh, arguments or sound bites in the media if you encounter with this. So it's, it's you can you can also prepare the decision makers that there are there are counter arguments. Uh, also. Um, also, uh, it's good to include some information on the cost effectiveness of the proposed solution com compared to the oppose opposing policies. So to show that the harm reduction is not only about you know spending money, but it will save you also some 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 money. And um, uh, advocacy is not should not be limited to periodical campaigns. But I think the the best way to do advocacy is that when you are becoming a, a kind of knowledge hub in your own field, uh, an organization that pr produces uh, produces uh, uh, evidence, uh, different kinds of reports, guidelines, and, uh, and and try to actively engage with the media. So don't only wait for the media to approach you. But 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 actively use the media like social media posts, blog posts, opinion pieces. Do give interviews, go to talk shows, because maybe you don't see the benefits in the in the short term. But when the remember the policy window, so when the policy window will open, that will be very beneficial for your advocacy. That you are uh, you are a very important voice in your field, and you will be the first to ask uh, by the media. And of course, other things like organizing public events, conferences, and producing videos is also effective. And my colleague Ishtan will speak about video advocacy in the second uh, webinar. Um, and uh, yeah, this you know, on this slide, I, I just wanted to show you an example that uh, that uh, direct lobbying can be really effective. This this. Uh, uh, Assessment was done in the U.S. among the members of Congresses and senators uh, who who were asked like what kind of um, what kind of um, uh, advocacy strategies made the best impact on their decisions. And as you see, in-person visits, uh, in-person communication was the most uh, most effective according to the decision makers themselves. And and uh, this shows that if you can, uh, if you can use this 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 option, if 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 it is open open to you, because building this kind of personal relationships, making personal appearances, make a personal impression on on decision makers, I think that is very valuable. Uh, I told you that you, you know you you should not present uh, your your research papers directly to decision makers. What you can do is to create backgrounder documents, for example, fact sheets or question and answer sheets. Uh, and these these are usually just one, two page or, or maximum five, six pages documents. And, um, and uh, even if these producing these briefing papers have sometimes not an immediate effect, but you will realize after a while that journalists will use your briefing papers when they are writing articles about the, about your issues. Uh, decision makers will use your papers when they searching the, the internet for arguments uh, in 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 policies. So I think it is it is worth the time to invest to produce a few thematic briefing papers within your organization 
and, um, and, and make them available online, send them to key players, media, decision makers. And, um, and also, I mean, in the for if you speak about the formats, um, you, you provide the uh, facts and figures, but you can also provide, uh, for example, quotes, uh, which can put the whole issue into context. For example, quotes from uh, affected communities. And um, it's also important to give your credentials and contact info in the end of this backgrounder if, if someone wants to seek your uh, 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 help. If you do street actions, just a few short uh, um, tips. Uh, on this picture, you can see that one, once we organized the street action in front of the United Nations building uh, in Vienna. And uh, if you do street actions, and if you, you would like the media to come and report, you should, I mean, you, you, should, you can think about something which is not so usual, uh, which is maybe unusual in uh, like the like the uh, like the visual, you know, how, what, what kind of visual you show to the media? For example, in this street action, what we did is we uh, we, we put cages on the street, and from uh, our our people were speaking outside from outside of the cages. Um, and of course, uh, if you do any kind of street actions, it's important if you expect people to join you then it is important to make these protesters to feel that, that they are important. So to do some kind of collective action or, or letting them know that how they can contact you and being in, be engaged after the protest is over is, is very important. Um, and of course, some, I, I've been to many street actions and protests and sometimes um, very simple problems can mean that they they fail to reach their objective for example if they if the speakers are just not audible enough and uh, people just don't understand what the speakers are speaking about so you have to you have to carefully prepare these in the end i i, I also wanted to mention you know that according to current research done by correlation most organizations report about negative trends in how civil society is treated, how decision makers perceive civil society's role. We call this phenomenon the shrinking space for civil society. So that there is there is like less funding, less political support, there are hostile media attacks in many of the countries of the European Union and I suppose in, in other countries it also happens. Um, and sometimes in some countries this space is not shrinking but already restricted. Because uh, because there are repressive legislate, legislative pieces against NGOs, foreign agent laws, for example. There is uh, legal and administrative harassment against organizations. Uh, what we see in many countries, for example, in Hungary too, uh, that governments create their own so-called gongos uh, to replace the NGOs. For example, in Hungary, the government created a, a pro-government so-called civil society organization, but it's of course it gets all the money from the government and it pro uh, pro uh, pro propagates uh, repressive solutions in drug policy. And we know that they only created it to oppose organizations like ours to, you know, to, to relativize this, uh, this whole scene and to show that, okay, so you see there are other organizations and they are uh, representing the complete opposite of what you are doing. So, I think in these this, uh, spaces, especially in the restricted spaces, Hungary is now between the two, like shrinking space, restricted space. Uh, it is very difficult to do good advocacy. Um, and um, sometimes what works or what worked in Hungary uh, is, is using an alternative entry point. That means that you maybe you, you realize that the national government is completely closed to your arguments, then you should get cut back your ambitions. Maybe you can see what can you do with local governments? Can you do some changes in the local level? For example, in, uh, in Hungary, we uh, did some uh, advocacy in the local level, in the Budapest level, 
And although the our government is very repressive and against any kind of harm reduction reforms, but we could get a new funding source from the municipality of Budapest, which has a um, opposition leadership. So, and, and another uh, way to deal with uh, deal with uh, this repressive space for civil society is to try to build coalitions and alliances uh, to multiply the voices of civil society and also to respond to threats together. Uh, in Hungary, we also have an informal network of civil society organizations that receive money from abroad and who are usually scapegoated by the government. Uh, you can do uh, public education about the role of civil society. Again, this is something that was tried in, in Hungary. And of course, building communities. Unfortunately, what I see in the Eastern part of Europe is that in many countries, especially where there is no global fund um, money, there are very weak uh, groups of people who use drugs. And I think that we need to change this. And um, without the involve, meaningful involvement of uh, the community of people, of people who use drugs, it is just, you know, um, it is just uh, makes no sense to speak about harm reduction advocacy. And of course, another, another issue which can, usually comes up when we speak to policymakers is that you know these civil society organizations they are political they are doing uh, political lobbying and advocacy they are serving some uh, foreign interests or or maybe some party party interests um, and I think it's it's important to for us civil society organizations to be ready with 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 telling them that policy making is not only the business of, of you know professional politicians. So you should know that you have each and every right to get to to be involved in decision maker and and uh, um, and making your voice heard, and and it's all, all, always a big dilemma, you know, with civil society organizations, how much distance you keep from political actors, because in most of our countries it's mostly left and progressive parties who support harm reduction. There are there are exemptions, of course. Uh, some some notable exam exemptions from this, but uh, but it, this is usually the case. And uh, if you get too close to these parties, then you they will accuse you of being just a mouthpiece of of political parties. So I I don't have a, you know like an absolute solution to this issue, but maybe later we can discuss how you are if you meet if you if you encounter this kind of criticism from the government and if yes how can you respond to this this kind of uh, uh, accusation so what do you think what is the highest healthy distance from from uh, party politics okay so a, a few words in the end about advocates uh, evaluating and monitoring uh, advocacy um, I found this quote in a in a very good article. The article is called the "Elusive Craft of Evaluating Advocacy." Even the, the title tells a lot because it says "elusive craft," and it's really elusive to to evaluate to speak about evaluation. It says that in advocacy evaluation, the cleaner the data, the less likely it is to measure what matters. And I think it's really true that. Um, Unlike you know when you are providing services and then you have you know okay I distributed these and these many syringes and uh, harm reduction kits and I reached out this and this number of people and in, in, in involved uh, or referred to treatment as many people then with, with advocacy this is not so simple it is not so simple to establish the connection between your activities and the changes of political policy making. Um, it is it is easy, you know, to monitor the outputs. For example, you know, like how many leaflets you gave out, or how many uh, uh, likes you had on Facebook, or how many viewers your video had, or how many people came to your events, how many news articles you were published after your campaign. This is this is relatively okay, but but you know, to to see what impact it really had on policymakers. That's very tricky. So it, it means that you need to differentiate between contribution and attribution. Like how can you, you, you surely you contributed, but how much can you attribute the change to your advocacy activity? 
And, and another problem or other challenge is that advocacy has no immediate impact. But um, it doesn't mean that, for example, you organize the campaign for changing the law on naloxone distribution in your country, and you may not reach your goal uh, within the time frame of your campaign, this direct law, but it doesn't mean that you can you, you just you just wasted your time because in the long run advocacy can be very effective if you if you if you if you look at uh, the long term uh, impact. Uh, so that that also means that I don't believe in uh, best practices in advocacy. I don't think that EMCDD best practice portal can put you know like a section on advocacy best practices that can be applied in uh, the same way as. Uh, best practices in harm reduction or uh, prevention can be applied in different countries and different political contexts because there is no one size fits all in solutions in advocacy. Uh, what worked in, a, in one country can be completely useless in another country. So if you hoped before my presentation that I will give you this kind of universal solutions, then uh, I sort unfortunately I, I <laughs> break your hopes, but I think it's still very useful for us to listen to our each other's experiences, lessons learned, uh, what worked in a, in a country, and then you can experiment in your country and you can try it out, but you cannot expect that it will like 100 or even 80% probability that it will work in your country because the cultural context, uh, the political context is very different in, in different countries. So one message can work in a country, in one country, and another can will not work in another country. Um, for example, my very good friend Ethan Nadelman, who was the uh, director of the Drug Policy Alliance in America, United States, I think he's a very very effective advocate in in the United States on drug policy reform. But then he came to Asia. We went to an Asian conference, and I'm sorry to tell you that though his arguments just didn't really work with the Asian Asian audience. So. The same arguments work with Americans. They 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 were like not not had a big impact on the Asian audience. So it's it's I and mean, probably this is also different even within Europe. Like if you go to Scandinavia or Spain or Greece or whatever, it's pretty different. Uh, may, you know, just one one tip about evaluation is that you if you have key players you want to influence. What you can do is to, you know, maybe measure like who are the key players in your field and how many people are aware of, 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 of your issue. You can make them aware if they are not. Uh, if they are just aware, then you can, the, the next level is that you can make alliances. So may, you make them allies to work together on an issue. And uh, the optimal scenario or the maximum you can reach is to make them champions of your issue. So this you can you can you can somehow measure uh, that uh, your advocacy how how effective your advocacy work is. And <clears throat> the long term advocacy long term impact of advocacy. Um, uh, an example is, for example, ca uh, cannabis reform in the U.S. Now you see that in several several countries of the U.S. you see uh, cannabis is being legalized. Um, and if you look at the public opinion in the U.S., you see that it very slowly changed. How can you make sure that what was the contribution of cannabis reform advocates to this process? I mean, you can't really measure that, but surely, even if you can't can't give an exact number how they were influencing it, but surely they had a big influence. Uh, for example, uh, yeah, uh, for example, um, uh, the if you look at the the media articles on cannabis issues, you see that the numbers kind of followed the trends of public uh, public uh, attitudes, the change of public attitudes. So it was exponentially growing as well. And of course, it is not that accidental what the media writes about. So what you know, cannabis organizations had a serious significant impact on that. Uh, but what exactly was the impact? It's very diff difficult to to measure. So. There, there is in every case, every advocacy issue, especially in harm reduction, there is a so-called abeyance, abeyance period. This is a period when there is not, nothing happens. So there is no substantial change in policy. 
But does it mean that you should not do any advocacy in these periods? No, it does not mean it because uh, as I mentioned to you, even in these periods, you can build your own credibility, your, you can build your own becoming a knowledge hub uh, in, in the public. And uh, when the policy window opens, then, uh, the, then it's really uh, can be very, uh, very useful. And of course, in, in advocacy, there is no, no linear steady progress. Uh, uh, and I think this is, this is one of the reasons why it is very difficult to get funding for advocacy because donors usually they expect you to deliver something uh, in a certain time period. And uh, if you cannot promise that you will deliver that change, then they will be not so happy to, um, to, to give you money. We have a media and video advocacy training. Uh, so this, this was just a short introduction to advocacy, advocacy in general. But we have a media advocacy training and video advocacy training, different uh, time uh, frames. Uh, we can do this online or in person. So if you are or your, your organization is uh, interested to learn how to use videos in advocacy or how to do effective media campaigns, uh, then you can contact me and we can we can arrange this. We had trainings from New Zealand to Africa, South Africa, so several organizations, several activist students. So these can be quite useful because they are very practical. So we have exercises, practical exercises for, for organizations. Uh, thank you for your attention. This is my email address. And, um, and now I would like to open the floor to your uh, experiences and before I before I uh, we, before we organize this uh, webinar I uh, approached a few harm reduction activists from countries from European countries and asked them to prepare with a short story about their own advocacy uh, in their country so what what works but that but didn't work in that country so I think it would be after this kind of more like theoretical introduction, it will be useful for you to listen to some practical experiences from harm reductionists from different regions of Europe. So first, uh, I would like to uh, ask, and, and of course, after this uh, three people, you will be also asked to share your thoughts and comments and questions uh, with the audience. I'm asking you: Do you have any specific questions regarding the regarding the presentation before we move to the to the specific uh, uh, interventions from people? If you have any questions or comments, please raise your hands. You can raise your hand on Zoom. Okay, I don't see any hands. So so. Uh, I let let's start with uh, Magda from Poland. Mag, uh, Magda Bartnik. Magda, Hi. can you please first uh, introduce yourself and um, and then just uh, share your story? Yeah. Short. Thanks for interesting and inspiring presentation. Uh, so I'm Magda Bartnik. I'm um, I'm from Poland. Um, and I work with um, harm reduction uh, organization, harm reduction service provider in Warsaw. I will uh, shortly uh, tell you about um, our uh, lobbying attempts to introduce naloxone in harm reduction services. So we've been trying to, um, to do it for years now. Um, and a couple of years back, but but the naloxone itself was just in injectable use and in in inpatient settings and emergency units uh, and um, the the legislation uh, enabled using naloxone outside of these settings uh, then we found out that the intranasal um, naloxone was uh, registered at the european level uh, and we tried to gain uh, the information from the National Center for Prevention of Addictions. This is the state institution was implementing uh, drug programs and drug policies. And we have a funding for harm reduction from, from this uh, National Center uh, to asking them whether they can provide us with the information 
uh, about the status of the of this intranasal naloxone in the you know Polish registry list. And actually, it was really difficult to get this information. We were waiting uh, a long time. Finally, we got this information, uh, and um, and we were told that uh, that the registry was on the na uh, European level at the European Union but not on the Polish registry lists. So we had a couple of meetings with them. We, meaning Precursor, my organization, our organization, and, and uh, three more, harm reduction organizations. Uh, and we started to prepare um, this draft of the project for the, for the National Center uh, once the intranasal naloxone was available. Uh, I mean, on the European level, which is an important point. It's it's really important that, you know, the intranasal form makes a huge difference and makes it possible to really implement these programs in the services, um, not just because um, it's, I don't know, it's easier and more uh, available, but the controversy around, you know, injections is, is not there, so it's easier to talk about it. So we, uh, first of all, we uh, analyze different models of, of naloxone use in different uh, harm reduction services in different countries, particularly in Estonia. And we had a couple of meetings with, with people from Estonia who, uh, who told us and described their model, and then we and then we uh, work on this, you know, Polish model in the frame of our legislation and what is possible. I mean, each country, in a way, has to have its own pathways. Otherwise, it's really difficult to to implement the the other models from other countries. At the same time, we we made a survey among uh, clients of harm reduction services, people uh, using opioids. Um, we did a survey uh, in order to, to present a needs assessment. Uh, the survey was done by 400 uh, people and the majority were victims uh, of overdose. More than half uh, were victims or knew someone who died from overdose. And at the same time, um, I mean, so we found out that the, the, the intranasal naloxone is produced by uh, Munti Pharma. Uh, it's with a brand name Nixoid. By the way, Munti Pharma is a, a sister company of Purdue Pharma, so the, the Sacklers. It's ironic, but but these are these people. And uh, Munti Pharma is the only producer that can produce and provide Nixoid at the European. Uh, I mean, in in Poland, right? It would because we still don't have this medication on our registry list. We, we, we had a couple of meetings with them, you know, presenting our uh, plan and the need, and they were very much interested. And we established, you know, informal co cooperation with the, with the, with the company, uh, and they proposed that they will um, produce and, and, um, and bring the, uh, the, the product, the medication to Poland and, and they would uh, go through all the procedures, you know, registry list. And it's also quite complicated uh, for us to be able to, to have access to it. Uh, so with this draft, with this whole, you know, uh, plan of the, of the, of the uh, pilot project and also needs assessment, uh, we then um, went back to the to the national center and and um, and just you know applied or just uh, uh, send them the, the, this draft asking what's possible uh, um, what's possible meaning which finding would go that whether it's harm reduction funding or treatment funding and it's this is still not clear. But they are very much open to this, and in my, you know, in my opinion, they are very much open and supportive at this point. You know, we talked with them multiple times. Um, you know, lobbying for 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 this, um, and underlying the need. 
but in a way they are very supportive and uh, hopefully the, the project, the pilot project will start at the end of this year because, you know, they don't have to do anything apart of funding it. So if it was done other way without pharma company wanting to cooperate, without having all these models of cooperation with other harm reduction services from other countries and having, you know, uh, needs assessment uh, reports, that will probably go different way. And we would probably not be able to have, you know, these strong arguments uh, for them. So it's the, the benefit for them is obvious. Uh, because other people are other institutions uh, are going will, will go through this whole procedure that you know honestly they would probably avoid or would would want to avoid so that would be in short uh, this this case thank you thank you so much magda uh, you can keep your questions after after the uh, after the short presentations, and the next one is Anna Quigley from Ireland. Anna, uh, great. Um, thank you, Peter. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And um, thanks very much for asking me to do this. God, it's only now I see the camera on. I realise I should have combed my hair. Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, thanks for the opportunity. And um, what I'm going to talk about is our. Um, campaigning and lobbying work around ending criminalization of people who use drugs in Ireland. And um, it's a very long story. So I'm going to give you a very, very short version of it. Um, uh, I'll do a qu quick uh, run through it first and then just highlight a few of the key learnings and um, that might be useful for people. So I'm going to look at my notes because if I don't, um, I'll just go on way too long. So, yeah, we're looking at ending criminalization of people who use drugs. So I suppose like citywide, the background citywide, I mean, we were set up in 1995 and actually we started life as a as an organization um, that actually believed in tough laws and believed that was the way that we had to deal with things. It was kind of a grassroots on the ground organization responding to things. Um, and we were we were ignorant and, and, and we believed tough laws would work. So we learned. Um, we learned from experience, we learned very quickly, um, and in particular as we started to get involved in a lot of our um, communities, uh, community organisations were set up that were directly providing services for people um, experiencing the impact of drugs and using drugs. So we learned, we learned from that experience um, and began to see why that that view just didn't didn't make any sense anymore. Um, and particularly when in 2012, we were doing a new kind of strategic plan for the organization, like people just kept bringing it up. Look, on the one hand, here we are, we've got a lot of really good community projects on the ground that are delivering services and working with 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 people. Um, so on the one hand, money has been invested in that. On the other hand, the state is effectively investing other money in criminalizing people and causing harm. So you've got two two arms of the state just totally at odds and at war with each other. And it just didn't make sense. And we could see it. For, we, everyone could see it for the people that, um, you know, were caught in the middle of that, that it didn't make any sense. And again, too, it was a time when um, we were very much aware of the need to hear the voices much more clearly of people who use drugs. And again, the fact that they were criminal obviously had, had you know, made that harder so in our own conversations we could just see this doesn't make sense anymore so in the 2012 plan it was identified um the one of the things we needed to do was start looking at the, the whole idea of not criminalizing people anymore so in 2013 we kind of did our first actual i suppose event around it we held a seminar and um, for our own networks initially and um, just to make sure everyone kind of could be part of the conversation and um, but we also invited the health research board who would be the Irish focal point for um what was the EMCCDA because they kind of gave us that institutional thing and we also invited Neve from release in London and she gave us the input on the international evidence and what was great because as I say we didn't look at the international evidence first we were just going on our own experience but it's actually great then when you do look at the the international evidence and it actually backs up what you're saying it's a relief I don't know what we'd have done if it hadn't but it did the, the international evidence backed us up and um, so from there we we um 
we so we had that we had the support of all our networks. The next step then was the politicians, um, and we produced a kind of briefing uh, document based on the seminar, and then we had a launch of that in the parliament in twenty fourteen with a number of politicians. Now at that stage, the the political support was very it was a, it was a handful of politicians, very few. But um, we made sure that the information leaflet uh, was sent to all of them. Um, every single politician got it um, regardless, um, even though not many were interested. And, and a couple of different politicians did get back to us. And this it was significant, though, one of those politicians, and it's all right for me to tell this story because he tells it himself, one of those politicians came, he described himself as a board backbencher, so he, and he was very interested in the issues around drugs and particularly decriminalisation. And he came to meet us and we had a great meeting about it. And then just by one of those chances that sometimes makes you think there is justice in this world, um, a vacancy for the drugs minister position came up a, a little while later and um, this guy Aon O'Riordan ended up getting the job. So that is one of those moments that makes you realise sometimes things do go your way. That's the happy bit of the story. Um, so, yeah. Um, that, that that was huge because he just progressed the agenda hugely, both in terms of safer injecting facilities and moving along towards decriminalisation. The new national drug strategy was being developed at the time and action went into us to set up a, a, a working group that would look at how it could be done. And I can remember now, uh, 2015 citywide, we had a conference for our um. 20th anniversary we had the president of ireland and we had the minister for drugs at the conference both saying yes absolutely not just decriminalization we need to look at regulation and we were made so we thought 2015 there you go and um, then this is the sad bit in 2016 we had an election um, and there was a change of government and the minister's party were, were no longer in the government um, that's not always a problem, but unfortunately, the new government that came in, really, there was nobody with any particular interest in the drugs issue or anyone that showed any particular understanding about it. So that set us back quite a bit. Um, probably a good lesson for us, I suppose. Um, the working group then did happen. That was one thing we felt, well, at least we have the working group now to look at decriminalisation. But unfortunately, that didn't work out too well. And um, there was a judge uh, appointed to, to chair it, which... Um, yeah, and then it was very civil service dominated and it didn't actually, it actually made the conclusion that we couldn't really introduce um, decriminalisation in Ireland. Um, so that 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 was also really difficult. Um, 2020 then, we so I mean, we, we, we just continued, you know, our, our kind of day to day um, lobbying work anyway, though that was, we were in a more difficult environment. We kept in touch with all the politicians. But 2020, um, yeah, we were heading into another election. And one of the things that was really important here was that uh, in the new the government that was set up after that election, the Green Party are a minority member in it, but they got a, an action put into the programme for government that there would be a citizens' assembly on drugs held in in, in um in Ireland. So that that again was huge because that Citizens Assembly now gave us a new forum to open up the discussion again on decriminalization in a much broader way. The Citizens Assembly is a mechanism that's used in Ireland where it's it's um to generally to deal with issues that we find very difficult. It has been used around the abortion issue, around um marriage equality. And it gives the opportunity for a wider group of citizens to actually discuss the issues and come up with conclusions. So that um, citizen assembly happened in 2023. Um, and... Uh, just to say that the voices of people did what you were talking about, Peter, the lived experience, the voices of people who use drugs and of the families were hugely critical in, in having the conversations with the general public. They made a huge impact. The good news then um, that a, a strong recommendation from the Citizens Assembly that we should end the criminalisation of people who use drugs. They've now made their recommendations. And we now have a, a parliamentary committee just which is which is currently being set up and its job will be to look at how do we implement the recommendations. So we're back in a hopeful space now where we actually do have a recommendation because it comes from the citizens. It's quite powerful because it's not seen as politically aligned. We have a recommendation that we should end criminalisation of people who use drugs in Ireland. We have a new um, government committee be, or a Roptus, a parliamentary committee being set up to to um, look at how we do it. There's quite a number of politicians on that committee who are strong supporters of um, ending criminalisation. So at this point, this is this is a 
I, 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 I'm afraid to describe it as a relatively happy note because you feel like you're tempting fate. But you know that we are at a, uh, at a, yeah, we're we're hopeful at the moment. Um, that 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 might um, you know, that might work. Our fingers crossed. Just very quickly, I mean, just because I, I know you're tight for time. Very quickly, um, key lessons. Um, back what you said, Peter, about telling stories. Like we found that crucial when we started off on looking at the issue around um ending criminalization. We didn't start in the point of view we have read a document or we have talked to experts. We said from living working in our communities, this does not make sense. This does not add up. This is not the right thing to do. So it was hugely based on our own story. And I think people have organizational stories. It, you know, everyone has one of those that actually explains this is why we want to do this. And I do think telling that story, obviously, then it was key to look at the evidence and bring that in. But I think it's always stood to us that we started with this is this is real for us. And we did didn't just learn it from a book kind of thing the second thing i suppose that our experience is that civil servants overall tend to be very conservative i don't necessarily mean that in terms of their political views just in that they tend to be reluctant to get involved in things that involve significant change they're cautious so obviously you need relationships with key civil servants but our experience is that they're they're not the people who actually bring about the change that that's very much the politicians that it needs that political uh, leadership from somebody somewhere in order to to kind of bring about any change that are significant and again with that we the only thing we our learning would be that whether it's good time or bad time and um, you just keep at it you just make sure every politician keeps getting your updates and keeps getting your asks all of the time because like that you know as we've we just have discovered you just never know you just don't know where you're going to find allies again it's it's an advantage to us because we're a network in terms of politicians that's an advantage because we have um, groups that are linked in in different parts of the country so again that's that is important too when it comes to politicians um again one other thing we find it useful too you can use other routes when you've got audiences that aren't you know don't really want to hear about ending criminalization and um, we've been involved and um, got funding from our human rights commission to do an anti-stigma campaign around drugs and nobody is pro stigma. Everybody thinks it's a bad idea to have stigma. So people will get on board in that. But actually, we were able to work a recommendation around any criminalization into that because clearly criminalizing people is a massive stigma. So there's kind of ways in other pieces of work of bringing in the in, in the criminalization and that pe some people who think they mightn't support it actually end up finding they do. And um, yeah, again, just on the citizens assembly, people um, who use drugs, their families, just crucial their lived experience their stories so we just keep saying all the time keep telling the stories i mean they really do do, do have the impact and the final thing i suppose to just say is our main thing from our experience is just stick with us like you know there's the good days and bad days um and and yeah we just re each time you just regroup and you keep going and and you never know and i totally agree with you peter it's very hard to evaluate we, you'd no idea like as as a, did this story like some of it is just chance pure chance you know but the one thing i would say is if we weren't doing the work in the background then you wouldn't be able to take advantage of the chances so that's i suppose the one thing we say is just stick with it just keep going because it's the right what we're doing is right so we stick with it regardless um yeah and keep going so that's sorry for rushing through, but I'm conscious of the, the time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, it's indeed quite, I think we can relate, many of us can relate to this story, like uh, when you invest a lot of time to establish some partnership with a decision maker and then they will rotate and there is another other government coming or other officials will replace the old one. And uh, it's completely new. You start from zero. So there is this stupid thing which is called democracy. <laughs> of course, it's it's very important, but but sometimes it makes our advocacy quite challenging. So thank you so much, uh, Anna. As I see, our you know planned time is uh, is up. So if if you have to leave, I understand if you have to leave, but uh, I appreciate any of you who would like to, to stay uh, with us and listen to uh, to the discussion which follows. Now I would like to ask uh, Anuska from uh, Finland to, to, talk about, um, to talk about one of the interesting advocacy campaigns they did in Helsinki. And uh, after Anuska, um, I will ask Marios to speak about Greece. 
Thank you, Peter. Um, thanks for your really amazing um, talk before. So I will very briefly go through um, our, <laughs> at the moment, quite um, hot going DCR campaign that we are doing. Um, so in Finland, we don't have yet DCRs. And the theme has been on, like, in people's talk for ages, but for about two years ago, we made a citizens initiative, which got all the 50,000 um, names that we needed, that it goes to the parliament and gets kind of like into the process of that the parliament has to consider what to do with it. And that's a slow process. So we still, that's still, that paper is still in the parliament going through. Um, in the meantime, a year ago, some private people, that wasn't any NGO or any certain organization that were private people who got sick of the waiting, they just opened um, uh, illegal DCR. Um, they made it for the media, actually. They made just to make a point to, to raise the question again, that why don't we have these? And um, well, they got the media attention, um, they got also the uh, police attention, and I think it was open less than two hours, and then it got closed because yeah, we can't do that yet in Finland. But actually, following up from that, um, my workplace where I work, I work at the A-Clinic Foundation. I'm head of street social work and we work closely. We're um, a team of, of 20 people and um, we work closely with the people using drugs, obviously. And what I understood from that campaign is actually that the people still don't know what a DCR really is. The people sitting in the parliament, the members of parliament, they don't know what happens in a DCR. So last autumn, um, our organization um, asked other organizations to kind of like come together and together we made a DCR simulation. Basically, we built up a DCR in one of our like um, low threshold places um, without the real customer. But we uh, invited member of the parliaments. There were like 20 in the end coming. Um, and we gave them a piece. Each of them got a piece of paper, which we actually had wrote them roles, meaning they were role playing our real customers. So they came in and they were, let's say, David, 30 years old with this and this addiction and coming to the DCR to use this and this drug. And then we walked them through what would happen in an actual DCR and how would they get help and why that would help and what would happen if they wouldn't get that help. And that made these people actually understand what it is, why we want DCRs. And each single one of the members of parliament that came to that simulation left saying, of course, I'm going to vote for this. Um, and this is, like I said, it's a slow process. The citizen initiative is still in the process in the parliament. Um, and at the moment, what we're now doing is that we're now inviting the members of parliaments like to come to um, do the outreach work with us. So I've had during this, like, let's say last six months, I've had over, I think I'm going in about 13 now and 13 different people coming with me on the streets and do kind of like follow the work that we do with these people that we, that we actually ask these DCRs for. So showing them why we need them, why do these people need them and, and that this is a good thing that we're not trying to kind of do anything stupid here. So in my point of view, giving them the actual understanding what it is about has been the key to make the people making these decisions understand why they should vote for it. And um, most of them who have said no to it in the beginning, have said no, because in the end, they haven't known what it was about. They thought that we just like helping these people inject drugs and that's it. 
they thought that these these DCRs are just some sort of like glass boxes where there's kind of nobody around to help you and then somebody just like can inject drugs and walk away again and they also other people thought that there's actually nurses giving these people the drugs and and there's been so many kind of like misunderstandings and misinformation about what it really is about and what happens there and how the connection is made and why that is made and in our experience, giving them a leaflet, telling these things doesn't go anywhere. So you actually need to get into the one-on-one conversation, show them what it's about, show them what kind of lives these people live at the moment and how the DCRs would make these lives better. And this has been kind of like one of the key, key kind of ideas in this whole advocacy plan that we have with this bill. Um, I'm not having very high hopes that this is going to go through very quickly yet in Finland. We have a very right wing um, government and I know that there's like really harsh opinions about this whole case. But I have my hopes in the fact that if this is now done well, kind of like the, the citizen initiative bill that is going through the parliament, when the government changes in three years, this might go through really easily because the, the groundwork is done. So that's kind of where we are in Finland at the moment with the DCR thing. And um, yeah, I'm not going to go any, any further on that because yeah, I could talk about it all day, but I'll give the floor to Marius next. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anuska. Very inspiring piece of advocacy. Uh, and now I'd like to ask my good friend from the country which invented democracy to speak about yeah. their yeah, experience. That's a kind of democracy. internal joke we have to say to the people who is watching here. So we're gonna not going to be misunderstood. Okay, so I, I, I okay, my, my, my story is not that inspiring like the previous ones. And uh, also, I have to highlight the fact that I'm now on a new position, on a new role. So I won't be really vocal as the previous times who I was actually uh, representing civil society organizations. I have just to say the following because we're talking about advocacy. As I always say, there are local factors who shapes, who shape the, our, our way of advocating. And in Greece, sometimes in a chaotic environment, when we're talking about harm reduction advocacy and drug user advocacy, we have also to answer one basic thing. What are we advocating for with very simple answers? So let's say that the local factors are a kind of a, an unstable social and economic environment extremely high death rates uh, to people who use drugs from multiple factors. One of them is overdose. It's around uh, the 40% of, uh, of deaths is overdose and the others are uh, uh, other, other issues. There is also a very toxic environment between the central government, the local government, blah, 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 blah. And there are also clashes between the NGOs. Peter mentioned before that when civil society uh, representatives go to a table and discuss with, uh, let's say, state uh, stakeholders, cannot afford to picking up fights between them or arguing. But this is not the case where I come from, unfortunately. The first thing we have to do here when we're advocating for naloxone, because we're going, this is this is our main issue today, is to find a common language with the people we are talking about. This is sometimes can be really can be really challenging. The second thing is that we have to expose the problem with evidence. Like we have a new research published in the Journal of International Drug Policy that actually proves the extremely high death rates from overdose in, in people who use drugs. 
And the third thing, after all that, we have to form a kind of alliance with these people. So we have to move on forward, uh, advocating for harm reduction and naloxone. In the past, we, we made as uh, users union networks and civil society organizations, we, uh, we grabbed the opportunity from the International Overdose Awareness Day, which is in the 31st of August. So we, we, we made a kind of, uh, let's say, uh, workshops during that day. Uh, and we tried to raise awareness about naloxone. Also in the Support Don't Panis campaign in 26th of June, and also we are lobbying behind closed doors. Now, in the level of the municipality, which is I work for uh, right now, the former administration was awarded from Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, because successfully made an alliance with civil society organizations and with top leading epidemiologists uh, advocating for naloxone. So the former administration with civil society organizations and top leading epidemiologists got an award around July of 23 in London. In March of 23, there was a modification in the law about naloxone who decharacterized naloxone as a drug, if you, if you can believe that, and made it available but only to state-funded or state-recognized organisms. In an open translation, that means that naloxone still is not available to peers and it's not available to civil society organizations. So we have always the Greek paradox. We were awarded internationally for the open <laughs> distribution of naloxone, but we don't have the open distribution of naloxone. And some uh, stakeholders present that, present the naloxone issue as a success in international fora that it's available for all, but it's not available for all. And we have very contradictory messages from the central government about what is going to happen in, in the meantime with Naloxone. So we have this alliance with Bloomberg Philanthropy. It's a strategy goal, a vital strategy for healthy cities and Athens is in it. And we have a kind of, uh, uh, let's say an outline of what we're going to do next. Some colleagues from civil society organizations met twice uh, the Minister of Health in the previous months, and they addressed the issue uh, of naloxone. Uh, we will take, as they say, a more aggressive stance, employing investigative journalism to pressure for transparency in action. Time to the upcoming World Drug Day, we plan to publish two or three articles that will explore and analyze the broader policy on problematic drug use and its implementation. The current situation, as we observe it, starkly contrasts the positive portrayal by the government and heads of relevant organizations. Our upcoming investigative efforts aims to expose and detail these discrepancies to the public. Furthermore, we'll produce a few videos supporting material and via social media channels. The communication material that we'll produce will be to increase pressure to government, implement the specific policy, which is Naloxone, available uh for all so this is our short term plan to do that and we hope this is going to work because it's it, it's unbelievable that a central government presents as a success story that naloxone is available for everybody and at the same time people are dying on the streets because naloxone is not available to peers and to civil society organizations. And that was my little story from the cradle of the Western civilization. <laughs> that was a joke. Thank you, thank you, Marius. Um, okay, so thank you so much for the, for the speakers who presented us their short stories of successes and failures in advocacy. And now I would like to ask uh, any of you have uh, questions 
um, about to, uh, about about this country examples, or if you if you want to share any other stories from other other countries, because I already talked a lot, so it would be better to give you the floor and maybe any of you have anything to ask or share. Okay, I I don't see any hands, but maybe that just means that everybody has to hurry because the, they are way ahead of our, way, way past the end of this uh, webinar. So if there are no more questions or comments, I, I would like to thank you again for uh, presenting your country's examples and everybody else who came to the to the webinar. This uh, recording of the webinar will be uploaded on Correlation website and probably will be sh shared on social media as well. So you can use it as a kind of tool uh, if you need it in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.